Good day. The news from the battlefronts on Ukraine yesterday was dominated by the announcement by President Putin that he had ordered a ceasefire to cover the period of the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Christian celebrations. Now, I should perhaps explain before I proceed further that this is split on the question of the celebration of Christmas in the Orthodox world. The Greek Orthodox Church, following the lead of the Patriarch of Constantinople, um, celebrates Christmas according to the uh, Western Gregorian calendar um, on the 25th, what everybody knows as the 25th, most people in the West know as the 25th of December. The Russian Orthodox Church has stuck with the old Julian calendar and Christmas, according to that calendar, is celebrated also on the 25th of December, but according to the Western calendar, that falls on the 7th of January. So today, 6th January, according to the Russian Orthodox Church, is Christmas Eve. And 7th January, tomorrow, is Christmas Day. So Putin's ceasefire announcement covers Christmas Eve um, and Christmas Day, specifically the periods when the Orthodox Church celebrates its two main services, Midnight Liturgy, or Mass, on Christmas Eve, and the day uh, celebration of the birth of Jesus, which is, of course, in the morning of Christmas Day. And this is Putin's announcement. I'm going to read it out in full. It's provided for us by the Kremlin's website. Upon the consideration of the address from His Holiness Prince Patriarch Kirill, that's the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, who asked for a Christmas truce, so that Orthodox Christians could celebrate Christmas uh, in um, the battle zone, the battle areas of Ukraine. To continue upon consideration of the address from His Holiness Patriarch Kirill, I instruct the Defence Minister of the Russian Federation to introduce a ceasefire along the entire line of contact in Ukraine from 1200 hours on January 6th, 2023 to 2400 hours on January 7th, 2023. As a large number of Orthodox Christians reside in the area of hostilities, we call on the Ukrainian side to declare a ceasefire to allow them to attend church services on Christmas Eve as well as on Christmas Day. Now, that is a 36 hour ceasefire. There's been all sorts of suggestions that this is. Uh, an opportunity that Putin has cynically announced this in order, as President Biden says, for the Russians to catch their breath and also to redeploy their forces in some way. Um, 36 hours in a battle zone as intense or as Ukraine, and given the large size of the forces deployed, would certainly not make either of those things possible. Anyway, that's Putin's announcement. Why has he done it? Um, he says that he's following the lead of the Patriarch of Moscow. Most people, I think, assume that the Patriarch and the Kremlin have been uh, speaking about this to each other and that the initiative might have come from the Kremlin. I'm not absolutely sure about that, by the way. The Orthodox Church in Russia does have its own um, agendas and ideas and policies. For the record, I don't think the Patriarch is any kind of tool or stooge of Putin's. But it's likely, more than likely, that this was discussed by the Patriarch and the Kremlin and that a joint agreement to do this was reached. So why has it been done? I'm going to anticipate by saying that I think the military in the Russian military who are conducting this war will have received this order 
through gritted teeth and they will not be happy with it. Uh, many of them may remember how during a crucial period of the Syrian war in late um, 2016, early 2017, whilst Syrian and Russian forces were pressing on Aleppo, where a part of the city was occupied by anti-government insurgents, Putin repeatedly announced uh, ceasefires and humanitarian corridors, um, interrupting the military campaign and perhaps prolonging the siege of Aleppo. And I remember that there was deep frustration from the military about this, the Russian military, and eventually this burst out into public criticism of Putin himself. That's a complicated story, I'm not going to go into it now, but anyway, that was what Putin did. And he did something very similar at the start of this conflict in Ukraine. The day after the Russian troops began to move into uh, Ukraine back in February, um, President Zelensky of Ukraine spoke about his wish to engage in negotiations with the Russians and Putin the very day after the um, advance into Ukraine began, ordered a ceasefire and a movement stop, which again, I understand, caused the military a great deal of frustration. Well, why has he done this again this time? And as we will see in a moment, his decision to announce this um, pause from the military's point of view, far from enabling them, the Russian military's point of view, far from enabling them to catch their breath and to redeploy, on the contrary, threatens to slow their momentum in one crucial part of the battle. Well, the short answer, I am sure, is that on the one hand, Putin is indeed an orthodox Christian. He does take his Christianity very seriously. Um, everybody who knows him appears to confirm this and perhaps he does have sentiments about the celebration of Christmas. I don't think we should discount these things. I appreciate that in the West Putin is invariably spoken about as a ruthless and a cynical man. I think that doesn't remotely do justice to the very complicated uh, nature of Putin's personality and to the fact that he can and has on numerous occasions shown a humane side. But of course there's also the politics of this and the politics here are twofold. On the one hand, he is, wants to show support for the Russian Orthodox Church. Now the reason for that is that the Russian Orthodox Church has been under very heavy pressure in Ukraine over the last uh, few months. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church, just to say, or perhaps one should say the Orthodox Church in Ukraine has a, a, a long-standing symbolic connection, largely symbolic connection to the Patriarchate of Moscow, but it is still considered by the Ukrainian government as some kind of proxy for Russia. And there have been an intense attempts to um, undermine and I suspect ultimately destroy it. So a couple of years ago, to the dismay of many Orthodox believers, but under, as many believe, American pressure, the Patriarch of Constantinople announced that he was recognizing as the official church of Ukraine, not the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that up to then had been the canonical church of Ukraine, but a um, separate uh, group of um, priests and um, believers who had specifically set up a Ukrainian church with no connection to Moscow and to Russia at all. Most Orthodox Christians in Ukraine, however, continue to adhere to the old canonical church, uh, the one that had the links with Russia. But over the last few months since the conflict began, 
perhaps unsurprisingly, that church has been the target of attacks. There have been um, entries of police and security officials into church buildings, um, including, by the way, monasteries, um, important, including a very important monastery in the Kremlin. Um, church officials have been arrested, investigations have been launched, all that sort of thing. So the church, the Orthodox Church, the church which the Moscow Patriarchate has had, its has had a historic connection with, is feeling under intense pressure. And I think the call for the ceasefire, which came from the Patriarch of Moscow, quite apart from the fact that, no doubt, as the Patriarch of Moscow and as an Orthodox priest, he does take the celebration of Christmas extremely seriously. But quite apart from that, probably the Russian Orthodox Church wants a ceasefire and an act of this sort in order to express its support for the Orthodox Church under government pressure in Ukraine and the Russian government, President Putin, wants to follow this up and that is why I suspect he's announced this particular ceasefire. It has had, however, one added bonus for him and now we're talking pure politics. Um, Putin has over the last um, few days again been reiterating his willingness to engage in discussions, negotiations with the Ukrainians to seek a diplomatic settlement to the conflict. Obviously it is a diplomatic settlement very much on his and on Russia's terms, but he has consistently said, as he has said throughout the war, that the door to negotiation for Ukraine is open. And he said this again yesterday, even as he was announcing the ceasefire, in a telephone conversation he had with President Erdogan of Turkey, who has once more um, positioned himself or is seeking to position himself as a mediator, and who, according to the Turkish media, had announced his intention of telephoning first Putin and then Zelensky to try to get the two to negotiate with each other. And it's an interesting readout that the Kremlin has provided of Putin's telephone conversation with Erdogan, and I'm going to read it in full, because it shows, for one thing, that Ukraine is now only one topic among several that these two leaders are discussing. But then, so to proceed with the readout, this is what the Kremlin readout says. Um, uh, Vladimir Putin had a telephone conversation with President of the Republic of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Now notice that the readout doesn't say that the telephone call happened at Erdogan's request. We actually know from the Turkish side that this was the case. But this is a very polite readout. It doesn't want to give the impression on this occasion that it is Erdogan who is coming as the suppliant, suppli supplicant to Putin. Anyway, the, the readout then goes on to say, the discussion covered issues related to further expanding economic ties, primarily in energy, with the priority being strategically significant projects like the creation of a regional natural gas hub in Turkey and the construction of the Akuyu nuclear power plant. The presidents touched on the situation around Ukraine. The Russian side emphasized the destructive role of the Western states, which are pumping the Kiev regime full of weapons and military equipment, and also providing operational and targeting information. We'll come to that shortly. In view of President Erdogan's offer for Turkey to mediate a political settlement to the conflict, Vladimir Putin again reaffirmed that Russia is open to a serious dialogue under the condition that the Kremlin Kiev authorities meet the clear demands that have been repeatedly laid out. 
And that, of course, includes demilitarization and what the Russians refer to as the erasing of the influence of that radical ideology from the 1930s and 1940s, which they say, with some cause, is rampant in Ukraine. And then Putin goes on to say, and recognize the new territorial realities. That is not just the loss of Donbass and the loss of Crimea, but the loss of Zaporozhye region and Kherson region as well. Anyway, I'm going to read out the rest of the readout I'm going to cut, um, because of course it covers interesting points, but I'm going to come back to that last paragraph shortly. Um, during a discussion of the status of the July 22nd Istanbul agreements on exporting Ukrainian grain and unblocking deliveries of food and fertilizer for from Russia, the emphasis was on the need for a good faith, comprehensive approach that would envisaging, envisage lifting all barriers to Russian exports. This has been, of course, a topic that the Russians have been grumbling about now for months, that the deal done was that they would place no obstacles in the path of Ukrainian grain exports by ship from the Black Sea ports, but that they expected and were promised in return that EU restrictions um, on the export through the EU of Russian food and fertilizer exports would be lifted, allowing those exports to take place unimpeded. And the Russians have been grumbling that they acted out their part of the agreement. The um, Ukrainian foods has been exported exactly as the Russians agreed. Um, the EU has dragged its feet on allowing fertilizer and food exports to pass from Russia to pass to leave the territory of the European Union. So Putin is bringing this up again and he's telling Erdogan who brokered that agreement about the food exports that he's got to get on the phone to Brussels and sort out any remaining problems that still exist. I should say that over the last few months, weeks, there has actually been an uptick in exports of Russian fertilizer and food that had been clogged up in European ports. But Putin clearly isn't satisfied with that, or else he's still hammering away at this because he wants to put the West on the defensive over the issue. Anyway, he then, the readout and goes on to say, the leaders considered the prospects of the Syrian settlement process and gave a positive assessment of the December 2022 meeting in Moscow of the Russian, Turkish and Syrian defense ministers, along with the heads of their respective intelligence services. The hope was expressed that continued contacts in this trilateral format will help radically improve the situation in the Syrian Arab Republic by restoring its territorial integrity, resolving the refugee problem, and combating international terrorist organizations. Um, I have discussed the Syrian-Turkish rapprochement and the Russian role in it extensively in programs on this channel, and also in a discussion with my colleague Alex Christoforou, um, we've discussed it extensively on the Duran. And if you want more details about it, I would refer you to those videos. But we see, again, the great importance that is being attached both by Putin and Erdogan to this process of Turkish-Syrian rapprochement. I'm not going to discuss it further in this programme. And then the two... The readout finishes, the leaders exchange New Year greetings and agree to maintain contact at contacts at various levels. So, a friendly call. But let's go back, since this is the primary discussion at the moment, to what Putin said about negotiations. He says that he's willing to sit down and negotiate with the Ukrainians. And, of course, what has now happened is that the Ukrainians in angry response to Putin's ceasefire proposals, 
have now announced that there will be no negotiations with the Russians at all. There has been a, there's been a statement to that effect from Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council. And despite some pressure from the United States before Christmas, in the autumn and winter, early winter, for Ukraine to moderate its position, that it's not prepared to sit down and have talks with the Russians. Um, the decree that Zelensky passed prohibiting that from happening uh, has not been uh, revoked or, 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 or withdrawn. And we see that the Ukrainians continue to say that they're not prepared to get, enter into negotiations. Now, from Putin's point of view, that is a political gift. Um, in a, his virtual summit meeting with President Xi Jinping of China last week, Xi Jinping actually commended Putin for the fact that he and Russia were prepared to engage Ukraine in negotiations. Putin can now come back and tell the Chinese, look, I'm prepared to sit down and talk. The Ukrainians are not. They categorically rule the idea of any discussions and negotiations out under any circumstances at all, it would seem. So that's what um, uh, Putin says. And uh, that's uh, rather what, what these events have done. As I said, the Ukrainians reacted in that way. I don't personally think that they have any interest in negotiations at all. I think that they know, the government in Kiev knows, that if negotiations were to take place now with the Russians entrenched in eastern Ukraine, the government in Kiev, the particular politicians who are in charge in Kiev, would lose power. And I'm afraid that holding on to power and their positions at the moment seems to be their overriding priority. And there doesn't seem to be the kind of persuasion from the West that might facilitate them into changing their minds. I will discuss all of this in more detail shortly. But from Putin's point of view, this rejection of any negotiations at all from the Ukrainian side, as I said, is a political and diplomatic gift. He can point this out to the Chinese, he can point this out to the Indians, he can point this out across the global south, and of course it plays directly into his advantage. He is reasonable, the Ukrainians are not. And I would add that the vehement way in which the Ukrainians rejected this Christmas ceasefire, and the vehement way in which the Western powers supported the Ukrainians in that rejection, which, by the way, surprised me coming from the Western powers. Well, anyway, all I will say about that is that that also, from a political point of view, from a diplomatic point of view, is probably a gift for Putin as well. Having said all of this, as I said previously, I think that the military will not be fully happy with this ceasefire announcement. And I say that because over the last um, few hours, there have been reports that the Russians have been making very considerable progress in the Bakhmut area. In fact, there's even been some talk from Russian telegram channels of an outright breakthrough. And I'm going to, first of all, uh, read um, a summary of what is happening in uh, the Bakhmut and Solidar um, area, um, provided by a Russian blogger called Boris Rojin. He likes to um, publish under the name, well, his website is published under the name of Colonel Kassad. He's an interesting personality, um, a person with strong communist convictions. I believe he's based in the Crimea. He is often, suffice to say, extremely critical of President Putin and of his government, but he is overall a very reliable source on events in Ukraine. Um, 
Um, he is not somebody who either sugarcoats Russian progress, uh, makes it look better than it actually is, or is in denial about Russian setbacks. On the contrary, he <laughs> talks considerably and often amplifies discussion about those. Anyway, this is what he has to say. He's provided, he provided a summary yesterday of the present state of the various fronts. He uh, says that um, in, uh, Av in the areas of Avdivka, Marinka, uh, Vuglada, things are basically fairly stable at the moment. He says that uh, a Ukrainian counterattack in uh, Zaporozhye region has been unsuccessful. He um, says that the front lines um, along the Dnieper River in Kherson region are entirely stable. There have been no successful advances by the Ukrainians across the Dnieper. And indeed, he straightforwardly contradicts claims that have appeared on some Ukrainian channels that a particular island in the Dnieper, Bolshoi Potemkin, has been captured by Ukraine. He says that the Russian military have confirmed that they're still in control, that they're in full control over that particular island. Um, there's been a lot of toing and froing on the islands in the Dnieper. I don't particularly attach significance to this. I'm not going to discuss that further. But this is what Boris Rojin has to say about the military situation in Bakhmut and Solidar. Solidar being, of course, uh, um, a town close to Bakhmut, um, very, very closely connected to Bakhmut. Um, one could argue that it is essentially a suburb of Bakhmut, though it is part of the Ukrainian defence lines that run from Bakhmut to Sivask, um, um, independently of the lines in Bakhmut itself. And this is what Rojin has to say about the situation on the battlefronts. And this is situation as of um, yesterday evening or perhaps this morning. Um, Artyomovsk direction, of course, he's Russian, so he refers to Bakhmut as Artyomovsk to avoid confusion. I will refer to it as Bakhmut, but please be aware that Boris Rojin obviously refers to the place as Artyomovsk. Anyway, he says that Wagner continues to advance on Podgorodnoye, reaching the outskirts of the village. Vi fighting also continues on the outskirts, outskirts of Kleshevka. Um, I've explained the importance of this, that it lies between Opitnoye, which is a village to the south of Bakhmut, through which a big road passes and enters Bakhmut. Kleshevka uh, is um, to the west of Opitnoye, and it is en route to another village called Ivanovka, which lies astride another key road leading into Bakhmut, this time from the west. And if Ivanif Ivanovka is eventually captured by the Russians, and there's reports now that there are Russian troops on the outskirts of Ivanovsk, Ivanovka, even though Opitnoye and Kleshevka are still contested. Well, if Ivanovka falls and um, Opitnoye falls, then one can say definitely that the Ukrainian troops inside Bakhmut are trapped. Anyway, to continue again with what Boris Rojin says, fighting also continues on the outskirts of Kleshevkaya, in the central part of Opitnoye, and in the industrial zone in the east of, uh, of Artyomovsk, in other words, Bakhmut. There is also a promotion, in other words, an advance, in the southeast and quarters of Bakhmut itself. The enemy, he means of course the Ukrainian army, continues to build up forces near Bakhmut to rotate, rotate its battered brigades, which have partially lost their cap combat capability in, in, after intense fighting. And then he discusses what's going on north of Bakhmut, immediately north of Bakhmut, 
uh, not far from the place Podgorodnoye, which he mentioned, uh, between uh, um, um, in Solidar, Podgorodnoye lies between Bakhmut and Solidar. And he says the following about Solidar. There is a significant advance in the town to the salt mines. Uh, I should say the salt mines in Solidar are enormous, and they're once upon a time, they were a major tourist attraction. But again, I'm not going to go into the details of this. There is a significant advance in the town to the salt mines, which was facilitated by both the offensive from Yakov Lyovka to the northern outskirts of the town and the Seversk Solidar Highway and the offensive from Bakhmutsky. Now, Bakhmutsky is a different place from Bakhmut. It should not, the two places should not be confused. Bakhmutsky is, in effect, I'm going to say it, the eastern, southeastern suburb of, or, or, or more perhaps, division of Solidar. Uh, and then he goes on to say, and that the advance, the offensive from Bakhmutsky led to the cap capture of the Konskaya station. Stubborn fighting continues near Belogorovka um, on the, and further north around Siversk. There are no changes. Now, since Boris Rogin since wrote all of this, there's been more information. And um, this I'm taking principally from Slavyangrad, as I said, a Russian or pro-Russian telegram channel. Um, as I said, when always needs to be conscious of its, you know, biases. But as I have repeatedly said, I have found it very reliable. I found it a very reliable um, telegram channel in reporting the events of the war. Um, and um, it's often also extremely critical of President Putin and his government and of the decisions, some of the decisions of the military commanders. Anyway, they are reporting and all the indications suggest that this is correct and accurate information that the entirety of Bakhmutsky, that's to say the eastern half of Solidar, is now essentially under Russian control. There were some suggestions yesterday that one large uh, complex of buildings on the fringe of Bakhmutsky, some kind of industrial complex, was still under Ukrainian control, and that might still be the case, but the residential areas of Bakhmutsky are under complete Russian control. And they also said that the Russians have now reached the very center of Solidar, and it looks as if or at least they're suggesting that the Ukrainian forces in Solidar are now in retreat, and that there's some suggestions, again, that the whole of Solidar is about to fall under Russian control. And Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is the head of the um, Wagner organization, he's actually come out with a statement. He said that talk about the capture by the Russians of Solidar, or he would say liberation of Solidar, but I'm going to stick with capture. Capture of Solidar uh, is premature, that progress is indeed being made there, but he doesn't like to, uh, um, you know, put the cart before the horse. He doesn't like to announce that something has happened before it has actually happened. He says that sometimes premature reporting can have consequences that can lead to lives being lost. But overall, it was a fairly upbeat comment from Prigozhin. Now, there's also been other reports about fighting in the Bakhmut area as well. And overall, the picture that's been given is of significant Russian advances in the entire Bakhmut area. Now, in the midst of all of this, along comes Mr. Putin and announces a ceasefire. And as I said, I am fairly sure that the military uh, leaders 
Prigozhin, but also the Russian commanders and the militia commanders in Bakhmut must be deeply frustrated. It must look to them as if they have the Ukrainians in and around Bakhmut on the run, or at least pushed into retreat, and suddenly they've been told to take, for 36 hours, no offensive action. Whether or not this is going to make any actual difference to the situation in Bakhmut, I don't know. I doubt it. I'm pretty sure that the local commanders will take steps to ensure that the gains that have been achieved over the last day or so are protected. But I am fairly sure that they're not happy with what Putin has ordered. In the meantime, by the way, there's also uh, Raj, this is also back, going back to Boris Rojan. He also provides some more information about the fighting in the um, Kremenaya, um, in the Kremenaya Svatovo area. And he says the enemy continues to attack in the direction of Kremenaya, but so far has not been able to achieve a significant result. The main stake was placed on the capture of Cherno, Cervonopopovka, but it remains under the control of Russian troops. Fighting also continues for Novozelovskoye, that's an area where the Russians have been attacking, as well as in the area of Makayevka. Now, I believe that this is a different Makayevka from the place where there was the Ukrainian missile strike that killed uh, well, the official figure is 89 soldiers. Um, so I believe this is a different place. By the way, if it is not, if it is in some way connected to the fighting in Kremenaya Svatovo, then, then that might explain the presence of those troops in Makayevka. Perhaps they were in transit um, towards the battlefronts um, in Kremenaya Svatovo. And that's why they were temporarily housed in a barracks. But I don't want to discuss that in any detail because I'm not sure that we're talking about the same place. But anyway, fighting continues for Neve Novozelovskoye as well as in the area of Makayevka and Kuzumovka. Despite that, the front, despite the fact that the front line here has a positional character, both sides strive to fight for the initiative. In other words, both sides are trying to conduct offensives. The Russians towards Kupiansk, where they're making slow but steady progress, and the Ukrainians towards Kremenaya and Svatovo, where they've been making launching attacks ever since October, but so far have been thrown back on every occasion. So that's where that's the state of the battlefields. Now, let me reiterate again. I don't know what the effect on the battlefronts of Putin's ceasefire announcement is going to be. As I said, I doubt that it's going to make any very significant difference. I don't see the Russians giving up any ground as a result of the ceasefire. Um, as I understand it, Russian troops have been set, told that they can act to defend their positions and themselves, and that extends to Russian artillery. Also, it's perhaps important to go back to Putin's instructions to, uh, to the defense ministry. Um, he, he, it says, the instruction reads, upon consideration of the address from His Holiness Patriarch Kirill, I instruct the Defence Minister of the Russian Federation to introduce a ceasefire along the entire line of contact. Now that means along the battlefronts, it doesn't, so far as I understand it, prevent the Russians from launching missile strikes and drone strikes across Ukraine. And I say that because Earlier today, I saw a map, again, it was on Slavyangrad, by the way, but I'm sure this same map can be found in various places, showing where the Ukrainians are announcing air raids, and it seemed to cover every part of Ukraine. So perhaps 
missile strikes and drone strikes are going to continue over this 36 hour period of the ceasefire. Um, that ceasefire will only mean that the Russians are not going to continue their offensives, or at least that's the announcement, and, uh, but they will try, hold on to their positions. And it'll be, it's questionable, it seems to me, whether the Ukrainians can take advantage of this ceasefire in order to uh, regain any lost ground. However, one thing the Ukrainians might be able to do, and this is why I said that the Russian military can't be pleased with this order, is that in the Bakhmut area, where they've been coming under all this pressure, where they've been losing ground, they could, and I expect they will, use this 36-hour hour time window to redeploy troops, to withdraw um, units that have been severely battered and suffered heavy losses and to replace them with fresher troops who are able to continue the fight. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say about the situation on the battlefields and about Putin's announcement. As I said, I don't know how significant it will be, but if we go back to Putin's announcement, um, a rather conversation, with Erdogan to repeat again in terms of an overall settlement of the conflict he has made it very clear Putin has very made it very clear that though he's prepared to sit down with the Ukrainians and to talk with them he has not shifted one iota from his position and to repeat again, Vladimir Putin, this is from the readout, the Russian readout, the Kremlin readout, Vladimir Putin again reaffirmed that Russia is open to a serious dialogue under the condition that the Kiev authorities meet the clear demands that have been repeatedly laid out and recognize the new territorial realities. So that's the long-term position. Putin may have announced a ceasefire, but he is not in any way watering down his position on Ukraine. At least that's what the readout says. Now, all of this is happening as we've seen some important decisions in the West. And to be precise, yesterday I talked about the um, French decision, President Macron, France's decision to deliver to uh, Ukraine these light-wheeled tanks. I expressed some scepticism as to what they could do in Ukraine. I was doubtful that they could do a very great deal. Um, and uh, there were reports swirling around yesterday that up to 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles would be supplied by, uh, uh, by the United States to Ukraine. And we now have confirmation that this will be the case, though we haven't yet had a formal announcement. And we've also had a report that Germany is also going to supply between 30 and 50 Marder infantry, German Marder infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine also. So it looks as if Germany and the United States will, between them, be supplying Ukraine with something like 100 infantry fighting vehicles, and France will be supplying Ukraine with um, an unknown number, perhaps 50, perhaps 100, uh, light-wheeled tanks. I believe, well, Brian Belletic has said that France has around 260 of these light-wheeled tanks, but they will uh, need to retain, the French will need to retain some of them because the replacement for these light-wheeled tanks is not going to appear until about 2030. So France will need to retain some of these vehicles um, until then. So that puts a limit on how many that France can supply to Ukraine. And by the way, there's been a picture, I've seen a photograph of a, what looks like a Ukrainian Antonov 
um, cargo plane unloading one of these French wheeled tanks. I'm assuming that that's at an airfield in Poland where, um, as I understand it, these systems are delivered to, Western systems are delivered to, and where the Ukrainians are inducted and tra are trained on the use of these vehicles. I, as I understand it, all the civil um, airfields in Ukraine are, to all intents and purposes, out of action. Anyway, that's the announcement. I'm going to go back to what uh, Rojin, Boris Rojin, has to say about this. And this is as I said, the same person that I discussed who provided us with a summary of the situation of the, on the battlefield. He said, it is reported that the United States intends to supply 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine following the A French AMX 10RC uh, heavy armoured vehicles. Further, until the end of January, we can expect a decision on the delivery of Marder infantry fighting vehicles from Germany. Um, and he says, in the case of the Marders, we can talk about the number of 30 to 50 pieces. And Rojin speculates that in the spring there will be deliveries of tanks and aircraft. I think tanks is highly likely. I'm not sure that the West is ready to supply aircraft at the moment, but you know, maybe they are, maybe they're not, we will see. But already there are reports that there's discussions between Germany, the United Kingdom and the United States about the delivery of tanks to Ukraine. It's quite likely that Leopard 2 tanks at least will be supplied to Ukraine at some point. The United States has apparently categorically ruled out the supply of Abrams, American Abrams tanks. They say they're too heavy for Ukraine and the engine, the gas turbine engine, is too uh, maintenance, too heavy in demanding in its maintenance for Ukraine to be able to use. And to be frank, I can't imagine the British would want to send some of their relatively small number of Challenger tanks to Ukraine either. We could perhaps, however, at some point see French Leclerc tanks being supplied alongside the Marders. Now, point to make here is that, of course, these supplies of armoured vehicles from the Western powers. It's another instance of Western leaders, specifically in this case, Olaf Scholz, doing something which previously they had made clear they didn't want or intend to do. They're having to supply Ukraine with these Western armored vehicles, not because Ukraine is winning the war, but because it is out of armoured vehicles. The large numbers of armoured vehicles that Ukraine had at the beginning of the war, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and those sort of things, a legacy from the Soviet era. Vast numbers of those have been destroyed. In the summer, the Western powers arranged for um, NATO's formal Warsaw Pact members, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, to supply Ukraine with Soviet-era um, weapon systems, tanks, armoured vehicles, and those sort of things. Ukraine used all that weaponry in its various offensives in the autumn, and that has largely gone too. So now the Western powers find themselves in the position where unless they supply Ukraine with armoured vehicles of some description, Ukraine will be without armoured vehicles and in no position either to conduct offensives uh, itself or to or withstand any Russian offensives which are to come. And that there, this is the reason for this delivery was, in my opinion, blurted out by President Biden in a cabinet meeting when he said that the war in Ukraine is in a critical situation. 
It's an interesting choice of word. It suggests that there's been a lot of discussion behind the scenes, and this is why the situation is seen as critical. It is because Ukraine is desperately short of armoured vehicles. Now, there's a few points I want to make about this. Firstly, I want to come back to a comment that Putin made in a press conference that he gave just before Christmas. Um, he was asked whether it was the case that the Western countries had run out of weapon systems, that they'd depleted their stocks of weapon systems. And this is something that has been discussed exhaustively and with great skill by Brian Belletic specifically um, on the new Atlas and others like Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vashinin have written about it. And it is indeed the case that the West is basically out of artillery and 155 millimeter ammunition and such things. But Putin, in response to the question of whether or not the Western powers were out of equipment, he said, he said the following, I do not think that the resources of Western countries and NATO members have been stretched thin. It is another matter that Ukraine is being supplied with weapons of the former Warsaw Pact countries, the majority of which are Soviet made. This resource is running out indeed. We have destroyed and burnt almost all of these weapons. There is only something like a few dozen armoured vehicles and a hundred of other weapon systems left. Other weapon systems, presumably tanks, uh, um, artillery, I presume armoured vehicles, he means IFVs, infantry fighting vehicles. We have destroyed a lot of them. The stock of these systems is almost exhausted. But this does not mean that Western countries and NATO, and NATO do not have other war weapons. They do have them. However, it is not easy to convert to new weapon systems, including NATO standard ones. This requires preparation time, personnel training, stocks of spare parts, maintenance and repair. It is a big and complicated issue. Now, it's an interesting set of comments from Putin because it suggests that Putin, before Christmas, knew that these announcements after the New Year holiday of supplies of armoured vehicles, Marder fighting vehicles, Bradley fighting vehicles, AM um, uh, French light tanks, uh, wheeled light tanks, he knew that that announcement was to come. That's the only way I can explain it. And it seems to me clear that the Russians not only have known that these deliveries would take place, but that they have also been preparing their defences in case Ukraine tries to use these weapons in an offensive capacity. Like many people, I have been greatly intrigued by these enormous fortified lines that the Russians have created, specifically in two areas along the combat lines. One is in the Kremenaya Svatovo area, and the other is in Zaporozhye and Kherson region. It's not coincidental, surely, that these are the two areas which, where there has been talk of Ukraine mounting an offensive. Now, given Ukraine's shortage of armoured vehicles, and let's go back to what Putin says, and he's probably got intelligence about this, we have destroyed and burnt out almost all of their Soviet era weapons. There is only something like a few dozen armoured vehicles and a hundred of other weapon systems left. Not enough, in other words, to conduct an offensive. But given that all of those vehicles have gone, what the Russians must have been concerned about 
And the reason why they're building all these tank traps and dragon's teeth and all of these elaborate defences that um, Brian Belletic has discussed and explained how they work in a brilliant video is surely because they were concerned and undoubtedly expecting that Ukraine before very long would be supplied by these armoured vehicles from the West. So we can see that the Russians have known for some time that this is coming. And in fact, Rojin, going back to Rojin, he puts the rationale of this in this um, sort of way. Um, um, we, uh, uh, in total, NATO wants to saturate the armed forces of Ukraine by spring with at least 200, 200 infantry fighting vehicles of various types and 250 to 300 and 350 new MICs, I presume he means tanks and that kind of thing, which are necessary for the brigades that are being formed. In other words, this is another attempt to rebuild another Ukrainian force to launch some sort of offensive. Now, I'm going to make a couple of observations about this. If Rojin has got this right, it still falls far below the numbers of machines that General Zaluzhny, the Ukrainian commander, uh, was talking about in the interview that he gave to The Economist some weeks ago. He's talked about 300 tanks, six to 700 infantry fighting vehicles, 500 howitzers. He's not going to get anything like that number. The other point, and it comes to something that has been said by Brian Belletic uh, in many programs, but which is also said by Putin, is that these machines that are being provided might not be the most suitable for Ukrainian conditions and for the situation that Ukraine is in now. To, to, to repeat again, and these are Putin's words, it is not easy to convert to new weapon systems, including NATO standard, times, standard ones. This requires preparation time, personnel training, stocks of spare parts, maintenance and repair. It is a big and complicated issue. Now, I'm not going to discuss the question of training. It's entirely possible that some of these Ukrainian troops that we've been hearing about going on training missions in Britain and in Europe have already been trained, at least in part, on some of these systems. It hadn't been announced before, but I would not be surprised if that was the case. And there may be some trained personnel able to use some of these systems around already. But the other points that Putin is making about stocks of spare parts, maintenance and repair, that it seems to me is going to be an enormous problem. These vehicles, the Bradley, the uh, French light tank, um, the Marder, infantry fighting vehicle from Germany, Leopard 2 tanks, if they're ever supplied. These were not designed for the combat environment which we see in Ukraine. They were designed to resist a Soviet offensive in Central Europe. And they're heavy, uh, very heavy in some cases, and um, their engines, because of the fact that they're so heavy, will demand large amounts of fuel and they will be very maintenance heavy as well. Now, on that point, I have some knowledge. Um, I can put it in this way very simply, and it's from things that I've done in the past. This is with a knowledge of commercial vehicle maintenance. But if we're talking about tanks, um, a good rule of thumb is that if you have a 40-ton tank and a 60-ton tank, then the maintenance that a, the 60-ton tank will need will be at least double that of the 40-ton tank. Um, 
This is for all sorts of reasons that I'm not going to get into uh, detail about. But the heavier a vehicle becomes, the more the maintenance load multiplies. And given how difficult it is already for Ukraine, they have to send their equipment to Poland and Germany for repair. Um, this is going to be a massive problem. These machines, Marders, Bradleys, those sort of things, are designed and do operate, would have operated effectively in Central Europe in the event of a war with the Soviets. They can be used with some effectiveness by the Americans and the Germans themselves, and they were used fairly effectively in the Middle East and in Afghanistan, but there there was massive logistical and maintenance support for them. In the very different battleground, which is Ukraine, they're not going to be able to be maintained to anything like the same level. So we're already hearing reports of how M777 howitzers don't work very well um, in Ukraine, that they constantly break down, they're not good for heavy barrages. We've heard reports about how the Caesar howitzers uh, that France provided, that all 18 of them are in various stages of disrepair, and one of them has been a total write-off. And I suspect the same problem is going to beset these Western armoured vehicles when they are just deployed. And to repeat again, there aren't vast numbers of them, nothing like the numbers that General Zeluzhny is talking about. Now, the United States does have thousands of Bradley infantry fighting vehicles that it could deploy to the battlefronts. Germany has far fewer murders, but it could probably supply more. But the more of these vehicles you supply, the more heavy the maintenance load becomes. And the same will be even more the case, by the way, if, as I fully expect, Ukraine does indeed eventually acquire Leopard 2 tanks and perhaps even Leclerc tanks from France. So this is something the Western powers said they would not do, and they said it for a good reason. I mean, these are weapons. They're not wonder weapons, as many have pointed out. They won't, in and of themselves, transform the battlefields. The Russians are ready for them. They built up these fortified lines. Putin knew about them. His comments, as I said, in that press conference, um, which, uh, um, by the way, um, took place um, um, on the 22nd of December. So as I said, this is before December. Um, um, the Russians are ready for them, and they have multiple means to destroy these systems. And in fact, it's not far from certain that these systems will be any more effective than the systems that Ukraine had previously and which it's already burned through. And the load, the maintenance load of keeping these systems on the battlefields is going to be extremely heavy and that will in itself, I suspect, limit the number that can be sent. So, there we go. However, we see that in response to problems, accumulating problems on the Ukrainian battlefields, Ukraine's loss of its armoured vehicle fleet, its tanks and its infantry fighting vehicles, what does the West do? Does it tell Ukraine, negotiate, this is the time to negotiate? No, it doubles down. You could say it reinforces failure. I'm afraid we are going to go through a long process of this before I suspect reason prevails. And of course, what damage will be done to Ukraine in the interim I'm not even going to, I shudder to think, and I'm not going to discuss on this programme. And of course, we now have all the big economic indicators in the West 
now flashing recession. But there we are. It's impossible, it seems, for the West to accept failure, or at least to try and negotiate a way out. Ukraine has just rejected negotiations, even as it is losing ground in the key battlefield of Bakhmut. And the West, far from telling Ukraine to negotiate, even though President Biden himself admits that the war is at a critical point, crisis point, if you like. What does he do? He doesn't pick up the telephone and talk to Putin and try and see whether the US and Russia can talk. He instead agrees with his friends, um, um, Scholz and Macron, to send armored vehicles to Ukraine instead. Well, there's not just been a there's not just been a delivery of armored vehicles. There's also apparently going to be a delivery of Sea Sparrow missiles. I'm not sure whether these are air-to-air -air missiles or more probably air defense missiles, but that's a topic I'm going to discuss in my next video. I've been speaking again for over an hour. I hope again that this has been a useful program. We've covered a lot of ground. We will see whether the ceasefire has any real meaning in this war or whether the fighting just continues as before and in any event i will keep you informed of events and um, just to remind you you can find all our videos on our various platforms locals rumble odyssey bitshoot rockfin and telegram you can support our work via patreon and subscribe star links under this uh, video. Uh, you should also remember to check out our shop and see the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those amazing things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Well, that's me for today. More from me soon. And can I just say, if you are uh, celebrating the Feast of Epiphany, as I will, Twelfth Night, as some people call it. Um, well, I wish you a very great joy of that celebration. Thank you again. More from me soon.